Hello and welcome to Rise Up. I'm Don Ennis. Right now it's August, and while everyone is sweating, what I notice we're also doing is dealing with a lot of heat, but not from the sun, from each other on the internet. Social media has become not so social. And what I wonder is, what is it that makes you angry, hot under the collar on the internet? You know how it is today. There's so many news that you don't believe in, you know. That's great. I, I was just going to say fake news. Is there anything on the internet that makes you angry at all? Ads. Ads. Ads yeah. bother me. They just pop up. It's just all those pop ups that fire stuff on the computer, that kind of stuff. It's very. Yeah. It's very a lot of ads are very intrusive. What makes you angry on the internet? I never go on the internet. You never go on the internet. <laughs> I have no social media because I don't want what about, to be part of it. And you keep it, your kids off the internet too? Sadly. <laughs> Sadly, you say? They want to be on it and they're not. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Too and much negativity in general, I think. Really? And that's the reason you don't want to be on the internet? because yeah, negativity. And well, and I don't want my kids... I don't know who's on it. I don't know who's on the other side. You know, everyone's, you know, everyone's entitled to their opinion and you're not always going to agree with it. But I mean, if they're willing to, you know, engage in a civil conversation, then that's great. But a lot of the time, people are just it's anonymous. They're online and they just say whatever they want, and they're looking to, you know, get a rise out of someone. What makes you angry on the internet? Is there anything on the internet that you just get angry about? Bad news. Bad news. Yeah. And when I see someone just getting killed on the internet, it's just like I'm just angry. Yeah. 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 And that stuff that's going on right now, that we all the same color, cause. Me and you are the same people. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. You yeah. all came out the oven too early and I came out <laughs> yeah. too late. That's all that is. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you think racism is a really big problem on the yeah. internet? Yeah. I love all people. I don't like that Charlottesville thing. Oh, yeah. isn't that awful? Yeah. What, what, what do you do when you see angry stuff that, or stuff that makes you angry? <laughs> <laughs> to talk about all this and how we can each use our social media more responsibly and effectively, I'm joined by David Ryan Polgar. He describes himself as a tech ethicist, exploring the impact of tech from an ethical, legal, and emotional perspective, providing the human side of technology. Welcome, David. It's great to meet you. Same here, Don. Now, glad to have. I saw glad you to be here. last month. I'm glad you're here too. I saw you last. Uh, no, in June actually, on uh, Loach's show. Uh, it's called Talk About Our Times. And it was we a met, lot of fun. Great we guy. met via Twitter. Yes, after we that. did. I also saw you on Fox 61. So you've been talking about this kind of thing. I have for a few years, yes, trying to get the word out. What is it that makes our opinions so important to us that we spend our days and nights typing away in our pajamas? Well, the, the biggest issue, Don, is that uh, even though we think that we're communicating with two billion people, let's say, on Facebook and millions of people on Twitter, usually it's a solitary activity. So here we are accessing the world's population, but we're doing it as I kind of said on, on, on Fox 61, we're doing it you know, in our pajamas when we have a mustard stain on our shirt, right? And a lot of times it's the very idea that it's, <laughs> that it's faceless and frictionless, right? Because if I'm talking to you right now and I say something that offends you, I see your facial features. You don't have that online, right? So a lot of people have talked about the very structure, the very environmental changes that oftentimes change our own behavior. And we've always seen this like, with famous studies like the Stanford Prison Study, right? You, in Stanford Prison Study, you took college students and you put them in an unusual environment. You made certain uh, certain college students uh, prison guards, and then all of a sudden, it got out of control. Likewise, we really need to apply that to social media and say, we can alter the environment, and, and that is going to tweak our human behavior. And I think that's what we're struggling with right now, is that a lot of our social media platforms are not always conducive to, to, to a healthy dialogue. And we've seen that in comment sections of a lot of websites, right? Never read the comments <laughs> is my I use, mantra. I used to call it six degrees of Obamacare, right? A couple of years ago, you could have been talking about lawn care, and by the sixth comment, it, it was somehow always about Obamacare. I said, <laughs> there's a problem here, right? People are, are using the platform not to, to get into a fluid conversation that's going to build and, that, and that's going to uh, improve society. Oftentimes, they, they view it as their own kind of personal soapbox, and I think we're sometimes seeing the negative consequence of that, of that activity. Does it bother you that a lot of people use pseudonyms, that they hide behind a phony name mm -hmm. so that they can spew anything? Is that a good idea? That's a, that's a hotly debated area because uh, Facebook, for one, does not allow anonymous uh, or, or false names. They even, a few years ago, Go gave Lady Gaga a tough time about using Lady Gaga as opposed to her actual name, right? So that's that's a hot area. 
what you would uh, intuitively think is that if somebody is transparent about who they are and who their employer is, that they wouldn't be a troll, they wouldn't be mean online. And while there can be a difference when people can hide behind this mask of an avatar or an uh, anonymity, I'm oh, constantly surprised by the amount of people that, that are publicly displayed and are still acting in a, in a troll-like behavior. So, and Coulter. I, well, I, you know, I, <laughs> she was not happy, I guess, with, with Delta. But uh, I think what, what's more important is that we as, as users need to transition to digital citizens, right? We're constantly thinking of ourselves as a consumer of a product or, or just mindlessly engaging with a platform as opposed to realizing that we are, uh, we are the web, that we're part of a, a larger community and that it's kind of up to us, right? Because we always think of trolls as this mythological beast, but I like to say they're, they're, they're us, yeah. right? So what we do... Oh, well, wait a minute, I'm not a troll. <laughs> well, no, but, but a lot of us a lot of us are, and we, we okay. also have a role. So, so if you see something inappropriate, you can, you can report that. If you see your friend getting bullied, you can stand up for them. You can have what we call counter speech or what a lot of people call upstanding type of behavior. I know, but I've also had great success and very uh, terrible anger over the fact that sometimes those reports are just ignored. It seems as if some people can do things with impunity and other people are knocked down or locked out for almost a month. Yeah, that's a, that's a tricky issue too. I, I think a lot of the major social media companies, and, I, and I've worked uh, with, with a few of them uh, planning conferences, <laughs> We, we constantly need to think, how do we, how do we become the uh, arbiter of, of freedom of speech? And I know Twitter, for example, they, they're, they're going to struggle with this because if they crack down too hard, then people are going to say, well, this is repressive. This is not allowing the free flow. This is not allowing our conception as an American of the marketplace of ideas. But if they're not hard enough, as, as a lot of people have, have, have stated, then you're going to say, well, wait a minute. Now, now I can't even be online because sure. I'm afraid that, that I'm going to get uh, harassed. So it's a, it's a fine balance. And I think, uh, I think companies are struggling with this. But to your point, it's yes. corporate social responsibility. And I think consumers are putting a little more pressure on. For transgender people on Facebook example, there was a real struggle because not everyone is out. A lot of people mm -hmm. are not out. And to be able to use a name on the internet is sort of a way of living that life before you're able to actually come out. Sure. And Facebook was denying that right to people, and it became a real controversy. I think they've resolved it as now, but I do wonder if it's misunderstood by the larger, um, we call it cisgender, non-trans community, yeah. how important it is to have a name that you can use and just in terms of protecting yourself from being fired because it's illegal yeah. in some places to be transgender. And on a similar uh, note with that, let's imagine somebody w was struggling with their, their gender identity and wanted to, to do certain searches. This is why uh, we, we have to have a certain level of anonymity online, right? Because you don't necessarily want all of your Google searches to go directly to everybody. You, you, you don't want to necessarily live your life publicly because you also have your own private ideas that sometimes you're, you're searching for. Right. And I think that's a, a lot of times what we forget in this, this argument. I see it all the time where, where especially uh, like parenting groups might focus on, okay, well, uh, you know, if you wouldn't say it to your grandma, don't put it online. And the reason why, I, I, I don't view that as uh, giving enough context is because we're always struggling with ideas as, as you're kind of inferring and we have to have certain outlets and I think that's the beauty of the internet is if we can work out the kinks it's a beautiful outlet to to other people that are struggling with something mm -hmm. it's a beautiful outlet to to other people who are, are like-minded and that was that was our kind of utopian view in the, in the late 90s <laughs> of the we internet. thought it was gonna happen right? so basically we've gone from a utopia to a dystopian vision and now we're trying to bring it back a little bit people think the internet's broken we're trying to trying to fix it right now I know. that's that's kind of what I'm trying to do I would hope you could be yes, successful um, I worked in the news business for 30 years Years. Mm -hmm. And at ABC News, our um, bosses kept an eye on our social media, and they actually told us, if you don't want to see it on the front page of the New York Post, don't <laughs> post it online. <laughs> and then I got my face on the front page of the New York Post, which, <laughs> you know, interesting life. Um, let's talk about the, um, the meme. Cancel all my meetings. Someone on the Internet is wrong. <laughs> Have you seen that? I have seen that. It happens that, yeah. to the best of us. What's your advice to not getting sucked into the drama? <laughs> I actually, yeah, I, I, I've seen that one because that's actually related to something called Cunningham's Law, which is basically saying, like, if you post something wrong on the Internet, it causes this compulsion. I wrote an uh, article for Big Think on that specific oh, meme. Oh, we'll have a link to that. Believe it or not, yeah, because basically if you post something that somebody else views as wrong, 
it actually incentivizes people to start acting as opposed to if they just have something, if you ask a question online, people will say, well, I'm not gonna reply to that. But if you post something wrong, for some reason that incites our passion, right? But, but to your point, I think uh, we're, all, we're all trying to deal with our own kind of emotional issues internally and sometimes the online social media platforms or online communities, it allows certain people to channel that and, and we don't always channel that constructively. So if, if I'm channeling uh, my behavior online to make friends, kind of like we did right here, right? So we met on Twitter and now, now I'm here, <laughs> right? That's the beautiful part of the internet. But, but instead, when somebody is saying they're struggling with something internally or they're upset for whatever reason and they're channeling that to put other people down, that's, that's the downside of the internet, right? So that's why I always like to say that, that social media is like, like, a, like a tool, right? It, it works like a, like a knife where it can either be used to inflict pain or it can be used to carve out a future that's, that's more socially just, more connected and, and more interesting, right? I mean, you can go in so many different directions and that's, that's what we're trying to do. We're sure. trying to, to, to say it's a, it's a tool. We need to educate, empower and engage people to, to again not be users, to be digital citizens and to actually build a better web. You mentioned in our online conversation mm -hmm. that you want to fight slacktivism, which I love. <laughs> it's a great word. <laughs> yeah. That's what I hope this show is doing. We've done five episodes. This is our sixth episode so far. We're trying to encourage people to not just sit and yell at the internet, but to get involved online yeah. and in their communities and in the world. What is your experience in terms of um, recommendations? What positive experiences can you suggest to our viewers? And I'll provide a link on mm -hmm. lifeafterdawn.com to get more involved. I would say first off, to start off with that, I'd say if, if a path seems too easy, then it's probably not the best path. And what I mean by that is sometimes it seems so easy to get engaged. You say, all I need to do is like this and subscribe to this and then I'm done. And you feel like you've, you've done something, but there's a, there's a larger step you can do. So, What's that? Well, for example, uh, Facebook, uh, they recently uh, integrated a feature where they said, now we can connect you with your, your elected official. Oh, right, cool. so that's an easier way to say, okay, you want to get involved now instead of just just uh, putting uh, negativity online. You can channel that into saying, let me talk to, let me talk to my senator, let me talk to my state representative. So that's the the key part is that use the internet or use the social media platforms as a conduit. To, to activism, mm -hmm. use it to say, well, how do I get involved, right? Mm -hmm. Because right now politics uh, in general are struggling where if you really wanna make a difference, right? If you're out there, if you're watching, you can go and you can become elected, right? You can, you can get involved because everything is a Google search away now. That has a great equalizer. That, right, it's a downside sometimes because we say, say well, you know, we're using the internet incorrectly or we're wasting time. But it also has a, it is an equalizer, right? Because we can now find out who is who. We can find out inf any information. We know where the events are. We can use those tools to say, okay, now I'm going to get more organized and I'm going to get involved. I'm going to rally together. I can form a group. I can form a meetup. But there's a flip side to that. There's always a flip side. The yep. flip side being privacy. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, anyone can be Googled, but a lot of people don't want to be Googled or they don't mm -hmm. want to have their information out there. Or you mentioned before about searching. Yes. When that's exposed, sometimes that could cost someone their career. Mm -hmm. It could actually um, cause people to end their lives. Yeah. So what yeah. do we do about privacy and what are the real dangers? How really easy is it for me to find out what your life is like when you don't want me to find out? This is a hot topic right now. A few years ago, Mark Zuckerberg uh, said, and then a few Facebook. other people, right, the founder of, of Facebook, uh, said, and a few other people kind of reiterated this idea that privacy is dead. Privacy is dead, long live privacy. The kicker is, even though we had predicted that uh, newer generation, digital natives, Gen Z now, that they don't care about privacy. I was just talking to a group of 16 and 17 year olds in New York and privacy was a huge concern for, for them because they're seeing the, the, the negative reaction, right? They're seeing stuff they, they might have thought was private now being used against them for employment and now being used against them for, College. uh, for colleges, yes. right? We had uh, Harvard recently rescind the, the uh, admission to a few students because of a private Facebook group. So they, oh, had, the, uh, they had the feeling of privacy, but it, but it wasn't private. And I, and I really have to go against, uh, again, uh, anybody who is advocating that uh, again, uh, you know, don't put something online. That, that you know, you you you're almost like a fear base. We shouldn't mm -hmm. be fear based. Obviously, we should be kind online, but we still need to have that 
kind of as you're pointing out, Don, we still need to have that ability, ability to have privacy. So for example, when you take something like Google Glass, that was augmented reality right. that Google tried Glasses to push. You were? Yeah, about two or three years ago. I think that was a telltale sign. The fact that it flopped and the fact that the, the, uh, the general public was strongly against the product that everybody in Silicon Valley was saying is the next big thing, that showed you that we actually do care about privacy, right? Because there was a, a few famous incidents where you know, somebody in San Francisco, they walk into a bar, they're wearing them, and then the people in the bar said, wait a minute, this is going against my feelings of saying, I don't want everything to be public. Right. And I, I think that's to your, to your larger point is that we're starting to say we need to push back a little bit and carve out that, that privacy. The, the downside is that most of our products, and I, and I deal with this, uh, most of the social media products are done as a opt out as opposed to an opt in. That strongly, and I can explain it, but that strongly, strongly influences user behavior. So for example, if you're told, okay, everything's gonna be public unless you opt out, nobody opts out because people just, they don't read contracts. We know this, nobody right. reads terms of service. Give away my firstborn, <laughs> click, yes, I agree. <laughs> that was actually a study, and 97% of people, done actually by a UConn professor, 97% of people would give away their firstborn child. They did a study of this, because nobody, <laughs> except for, I guess, 3% of people, are going to read these terms of service. But the point is, and this goes to your larger idea about activism, we can influence how social media companies act because they need to know what's what's right and what's wrong. That's the very idea of what I focus on with, with tech ethics, so the ethical, legal, emotional kind of perspective of technology. The main idea is that we need to always make our voice heard to say, well, you know what, my conception of privacy is, is different. Here's how I want to act. Here's the tools that I think social media companies should do. And that's a lot of what I've done in my past. I started something called Digital Citizenship Summit as a mm -hmm. co-founder. And that's what I was focused on to say, we need to bring together these stakeholders because then we can have a voice. We can bring together the administrators and educators and parents and students and industry and those top nonprofit organizations because everybody before was siloed. I have some personal experience here. Mm -hmm. um, 30 years in television yeah. news. One of the things we did, anytime something happened to anybody who wasn't public, would go to their Facebook page. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how many people don't lock down their Facebook accounts. And they post pictures of their children, sure. they post pictures of themselves. Hey, look at me at the strippy bar, you know? <laughs> um, not me. <laughs> but my point being that one thing I'd always recommend to folks is set all your settings for friends only. Yeah because then the media cannot see what you're doing. And God forbid you ever you know, are the victim of news. Usually it's yeah. always bad news, mm -hmm. not usually winning the lottery. That way no one can get your stuff. Um, that happened to me, mm -hmm. um, of all people. I, was, um, I came out as transgender and the media decided to do a search of my pictures and they posted pictures of my late wife and me all over the internet, what I looked like before, mm -hmm. what I look like now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I learned a hard lesson. Yeah. Um, I also got a lot of criticism from non-tech people saying, well, the reason you made all the newspapers is because you posted your transition on Facebook. Mm. What, I'm not supposed to tell everyone why my name is now right, Dawn and why right. I have yeah. <laughs> a different appearance. You know, it's like, that doesn't make any sense. Of course I'm going to share that with my Facebook friends. Mm -hmm. It's an important part of my life. Um, I don't think people should be shamed just because they decide to share. Yeah. So Facebook, here we are right now talking about in the present and we're talking about things like, hey, what are we posting online? Well, it's going to get crazy in the future because one of the things that Facebook is working on is the, uh, the human to computer interface, uh, or brain, sorry, the, the brain uh, to computer interface. And right. what, that's, what that's doing is so saying that you could read your thoughts and then have that automatically be posted online. You want to talk about the, the amount of ridiculous uh, sure. posts that we post now. Imagine if there was zero filter and you're literally kind of saying, okay, you know, blink if you agree, you know, that type of idea. Yes. And I think that's where, again, you're going to see some kind of pushback because we're starting to realize that friction in life sometimes is a good thing. And I think that's why, unfortunately, we've seen a lot of troll-like behavior online, sexual harassment, misogyny, you name it, is because people operate needing friction. We need this online, what I call an online Jiminy Cricket. We need somebody on our shoulders saying, well, wait a minute, right? The poison pen letter. We need somebody to say, maybe that's not a good idea. Whereas with social media, right, if you're on Twitter, what's, what's in my head and what can be said, there's zero gap. True. Right? It's also socially improper, I'm told, or impolite to delete your comments. 
I don't know mm. if you've heard this, but a lot of people feel that if you delete something you posted that was incendiary, right. you're actually causing more uh, verbal violence. Yeah. Why is that? Is it because we're not allowed to delete stuff? Well, it's because there's a, no, there's a huge debate about uh, who's being repressive. I know I've seen a lot of this. I remember one time a friend of mine wrote an article about be kind online. I'm thinking, who can disagree with this <laughs> sentiment? Be kind online. You think everybody say, oh, of course, right? And, and there was a ton of comments to this on the Huffington Post. There was a ton of comments saying, oh, this is, this is repressive. You're, you're taking away my freedom of speech. So, wait a minute. This person is suggesting that you be kind online. So I, I think, honestly, there's a huge fight for how should we operate on, uh, online and what should that level of civility be? David, uh, thank yeah. you. Thank this you. Is great. Thank you, Don. Now, this month's special correspondent is no stranger to television. She was a broadcast journalist, and we worked together like 25 years ago. And then she left to become a very successful lawyer. And now she's running for office. What's interesting about her is that neither one of us knew the other was transgender when we worked together 25 years ago. And we talk about how interesting that would have been if we had both come out, at least to each other. Without further ado, let me introduce you to Chrissy Browdy. She goes by Kristen Browdy, officially, and she is rising up. Thanks, Dawn. Hi, everybody. My name's Kristen. My friends call me Chrissy. Um, and this is my story of rising up. Now, I'm about 250 miles away from my hometown, which is Chappaqua, New York. The town's actually called Newcastle. And it's there that I'm rising up by not just coming out as transgender, which I did a couple of years back, but by running for town supervisor and running with party endorsement. In fact, three parties endorsement. And that's something that's never been done before. No transgender woman in New York has ever had the nomination of one party, much less three. And we're going to be on the Democratic and the Working Families and the Women's Equality Party lines on the ballot November 7th, exactly 100 days from today as I'm recording this. And the story of why I'm in Washington 100 days before my election up in Newcastle, New York, is part of the story of rising up. Now, I came down here in order to join with some 300 other progressives some of them trans, some of them LGBT, but most of them cis and uh, straight. And our idea, and it's an idea that I hope you'll join me in, is that we can't just worry about what goes on down here in Washington. I mean, you know, you got the Congress back there, um, and they've been doing some things that, of course, we're not terribly fond of in the past month or two, trying to pass an agenda that is not just anti-trans, but is anti almost everybody in the United States. It's taking away health care from 30 million people. And together, we're rising up to say no to that. And the way I'm rising up, the, my part of this is running for our town supervisor position. That's the equivalent of mayor. And what it means is on a number of levels. Now, people in my town, the local politicians, the Republicans that I'm running against, they're saying, oh, she's running a national campaign. Well, what happens in this town, what happens right down the street here at the Capitol, matters up where we live and where you live. And together, if we push back against that, we can stop this kind of crazy right-wing agenda that's being pushed at us from the Trump administration and from Mike Pence, his vice president, and the right-wing Republicans who've taken over Congress. Let me tell you the way they did that. It, they didn't start here in Washington. They started in towns like mine, in towns like yours, by taking over school boards first, by taking over town governments. You know, Democrats and progressives have always said, oh, we got to take care of the presidency, we got to take care of Congress, we got to take care of the big races, maybe governor's races but they haven't really cared about the nuts and bolts of governing for quite some time to come. And as a result, this building right here, the Supreme Court, is packed with judges that may be a problem for a lot of us. I mean, Gorsuch, really? I mean, we had Scalia, Scalia's gone, but we've got Alito in there too. And Clarence Thomas, I mean, really? Those are not your friends. So what do you do to rise up against them? Well, what you do to rise up is not just come out, because coming out sends a message to everybody else in your town that you're just like everybody else, and that is important. I mean, that pro-equality message really matters. But 
you got to do more than just coming out. And that's something that I realized after a couple of years. I didn't plan to run for political office. I was actually recruited by our local Democrats. And like Don, I spent most of my adult life as a journalist. I'd never joined a political party at all, ever, in my life. But they said, would you run? We like what you have to say. I thought about it. I mean, you know, the idea of a trans woman coming out and running for office is not exactly the normal path for us. But guess what? I'm doing it and you can do it too and you should do it too. You should do it in your town. You should get involved in your school board because you probably have kids or maybe you've just come out of the schools and you've got a better idea of what can go on in your place, in your town, in your county. That makes a difference. People see you. People see that your concerns are the same as theirs. And guess what? All of a sudden, equality isn't so weird because you are just like them. And I want to tell you, you know, we're still 100 days from an election. But I want to tell you why I'm convinced this campaign is already a success. Three days ago, as I, as I record this, one of my volunteers, one of the people who's working on my campaign, sent me a text message. And I got to tell you, I cried for about half an hour after reading it. She came out to me as transgender. And she said the reason that she did, that she felt free to come out to me, is she saw what I was doing. And the reason her parents are now in a much better place is that they know me and they see what I'm doing. And they say that you can, they see that you can have a life that works just fine, even if you're trans. And that, to me, is victory. That, to me, is rising up. So I hope that it works for you. I hope that you'll support my campaign. And most of all, I hope that you'll rise up wherever you are. Back to you in the studio, Don. Thank you, Chrissy. Thanks for joining us. You can find out more about both Chrissy and about David and all the work they're doing at the link on your screen, lifeafterdawn.com. There we'll provide you with links to all of their work and ways that you can support them as they try to rise up. You know, we're on Facebook and Twitter too at Rise Up With Dawn, and I hope you'll follow us there. Well, that's all for this month's episode. Please share and subscribe, and thanks for being with us. Remember, rise up.